less than once a week. And, and uh, uh, that's been the case for a very long time. Now, um, as when you begin to go up the pyramid, you see that wavy line there. And that's where substance use disorders actually start. It's wavy because it's different. Uh, the frequencies of uh, people who have a, a substance use problem differ by substance, but, uh, uh, but it's in that approximate region. And, and it's uh, pictured as, as having a broken line because people go back and forth all the time between uh, uh, having this level of use and um, no, no problem whatsoever. And this is called medically or socially harmful use. Uh, it's an. So um, two points. First point is it's not addiction. The the people that we're going to talk about here are not addicted. They would not meet uh, any ICD or DSM criteria for addiction. But it is nonetheless the case that their substance use is interfering with their usually medical health, with their relationships, with their performance on work. So that's point one. Point two is there are a great deal of these people, about 60 million people uh, in this country have a substance use disorder. And the reason this is so important, this group, it, is that uh, it's rarely been discussed. M mostly, the substance use disorders focus just on the most severe and um, uh, chronic of, of the problems, addiction, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but this is the population that is most uh, uh, eligible and suitable for, for substance use, uh, substance, uh, sorry, uh, screening and brief intervention. Okay, just to finish out the, the pyramid here, as you go up to the uh, bright solid line there, that's where addiction is. And again, um, there are a very large number, about the same number of people who uh, meet diagnostic criteria for diabetes, uh, meet diagnostic criteria for alcohol, opiate, cocaine, uh, methamphetamine, marijuana uh, addiction. And the, the pinnacle on the top there is just the just designates the proportion of people who are getting any kind of care at all. So at the very beginning, it's important for you to take a look at this because lots of people, especially in general medicine, will say, "Why do I have to screen for addiction? I could see an addict any time." Well, you're not screening for addiction. You're screening for a harmful substance use disorder much more subtle, but much more pervasive. Here's a good example. Suppose I said a young college-age woman is drinking two to three drinks of alcohol a night. Nobody would imagine that she is addicted. She may be at the, the high end of um, uh, you know, non-harmful use, but she's probably otherwise healthy, uh, young, etc. But now I say, Oh, by the way, she's pregnant. Now, that's harmful substance use, not to her, but to her fetus. Okay, So that's not the kind of thing that you would see on a, a prenatal examination. You wouldn't imagine from any kind of physical symptoms or signs that the, the uh, young woman had a problem. And that's why screening and brief interventions are so important. OK, very important. So that's the target group right there. The people who have begun to use too much for their health condition or their uh, relationships or their performance, but probably not people who are in uh, have already lost control of their substance use and, and are addicted. Here's another reason why it's so important to do screening and brief interventions, particularly in medical settings. Um, I'm going to show you results of a series of uh, structured literature reviews which were done uh, to look at especially how alcohol and to a lesser extent other drug use even below the level of addiction, again very important, not addicted people, people whose use is below the level of addiction, that use nonetheless accounts for misdiagnoses, 
poor adherence to, to either attendance at their prescribed um, uh, appointments or and, and their rest of the prescribed care. Uh, substance use can interfere with commonly prescribed medications and indeed can lead to um, overdoses and deaths. Uh, wastes physician time, lots of unnecessary medical testing, poor outcomes, uh, and lots of increased costs. This is particularly true. All these things are true, particularly in if an individual has another chronic illness. Diabetes, hypertension, asthma, chronic pain, even chronic tooth decay, uh, sleep disorders, all these uh, can be negatively influenced. So again, that's the reason screening and brief interventions are so important. And finally, we're talking again about not screening for Charlie Sheen or uh, Lindsay Lohan. We're not looking for people whose substance use is so clearly over the top that anybody could detect it. Um, and let's start with a, the first of three stories that talks about despite the prevalence of these problems, despite the importance of these problems for general medicine, just how difficult it is and what kinds of factors are so important in actually getting this implemented. So the first is a, a study that uh, I was personally involved in. Uh, in a, a very large and important uh, uh, medical center in, in Philadelphia. And uh, the CEO of that hospital system had uh, served on the Joint Commission uh, for, for uh, uh, hospital accreditation, and he said, literally, at a meeting of all the deans of all the, the uh, schools and departments in the medical center, JCAH wants this, whatever it is. I don't know what it is, but I, uh, so we have to have it in the whole system. Uh, we're going to start with anybody who will be willing to start with this. So frankly, in order to curry favor with the uh, hospital CEO, the cancer center administrator, actually the assistant administrator, the, the, the regular one was had not been at the meeting, he raises his hand. Uh, wants a few brownie points and says, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. So with that, and, and I, I want to emphasize, uh, we were, this was mandated by the hospital CEO uh, and uh, agreed to by their organization uh, director. I was asked to meet with the Cancer Center medical staff, a very competent, very well-known medical center uh, cancer staff. So I go in there, and I'm a substance uh, use guy, and I tell them of all the things I just went through with you, well, how this compromises care, and uh, uh, drugs are bad for you, and are there any questions? Nope, not a single question. So I thought, wow, that's great. I'm, I must be even better than I thought. I'm perfectly clear. Well, not quite, because I had just gotten back to my own office from giving this talk and I get a letter that comes from the cancer center doctors to the dean of the medical school and this is the quote why do we have to do psychiatry's work this has nothing to do with the uh, treatment of cancer we don't have time to and I quote troll for addicts it has nothing to do with our mission so um, let's call that a bad start okay so I asked for one more meeting with the, the same set of physicians, and, and I uh, went back and I said, now look, I am very sorry, but I didn't show you the research. And I showed them n not work that was done by some psychologist who works in the addiction field. Nope. I gave them four structured literature reviews about the role of subdiagnostic alcohol use and breast cancer. So it was completely germane to the issue that they were uh, working on, breast cancer. Okay, this was the breast cancer uh, section of the cancer center. Uh, there was no doubt about it. Alcohol, and it had not been found by, again, some psychologist or counselor or social worker. Nope, a cancer 
researchers had established unequivocal uh, evidence that alcohol was a significant predictor of susceptibility to breast cancer. And if you have breast cancer, by the way, this is not true for all cancers, but if you have breast cancer, it interferes with the treatment. So point one, that research was unequivocal. Um, uh, second, I showed them the research that was that had been done showing that a very brief intervention that could be done by a wide variety of people, not necessarily them, would reduce problematic substance use in people who had not lost control. So it's it's if you don't look for this, it can screw up your your breast cancer treatment. If you do look for it, it's it, uh, it you will be paid to do so, and uh, a very brief intervention can can reduce it. Okay, so and then I finished the presentation with the following uh, comments. I said, now look, I'm not here for you guys to do me a favor or for the CEO of the hospital to have a favor. I, I really don't care. I'll I'll be happy to go someplace else. In fact. If this isn't good for cancer treatment, not only don't I want you to do it, you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do anything that is going to interfere with your major job. But let's agree on the basis of the research to take a fair look at this. So with that, I, I left and I asked for a meeting um, uh, 10 days later. Now, to their credit, for, for, first of all, they didn't believe it. Uh, this was a major cancer center with very significant, uh, very well-known people. They had never heard of a relationship between alcohol and breast cancer, and they went through that research with a fine-tooth comb. And uh, once again, it was done by people just like them for the patients that they treated, so it was highly relevant, and it was accurate. So now the conversation changed, and the third meeting came back was an entirely different meeting. And, and that's the point I'm trying to get to you. You're, you're not even going to get to the meeting I'm about to describe until you make it clear that what you have to sell is something that's in their interest that they can do something about and will, will help them in their major mission. Okay, so now they're, they're admittedly surprised that this is an issue at all, uh, but now everything turns to how's it going to fit? Is this really something we can do? We are a very busy place. We have rotations of new residents, new fellows coming in every 12 weeks. We don't uh, have, to, we can't have uh, this kind of thing interfere with that training and with their their clinical duties. Um, and just exactly who's going to do this? When are they going to do it? And how are they going to do it? And I had said, look. You don't want some psychologist telling you how, when, and uh, where to do this. What we ought to do is try to figure this out. Now, if you agree with me that it's something that, you sh that would help you, or potentially, let's figure that out together because you know how your, your workflow goes. I don't. And so uh, a, a very important thing, and I had really... I was really surprised by this. I thought they'd be interested in the concept of this and want to then take it on their own. Just exactly the opposite. They wanted to know precisely and exactly what to look for, when to look for, how to look for it, and I mean a detailed protocol. And then they wanted the exact words they should say to these uh, women who, who would be potentially uh, affected, uh, what exactly would they should say? And I, I, I have to emphasize that. These otherwise very well-trained physicians who, who make very important uh, judgment calls and have to present lots of complicated information, they did not know what to say to uh, women about their use of alcohol. And they were very worried that any conversation was really going to um, uh, screw up the relationship that, that, that they had. And the last thing they wanted um, was they said, we're not doing a damn thing unless this is on the electronic health record. The electronic health record does keep uh, the record of all procedures and, and, and it's the source of all our quality paradigms uh, for everything that we do. 
So it's I often say it, it was sort of like um, the wizard telling uh, Dorothy, uh, you have to go get the witch's broom if you want me to take you uh, back to Kansas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go go get that witch's broom and then see if you can. Uh, and then I'll I'll do something for you. So we did. We went. And uh, frankly, they said this will never happen. It's it, it's it's going to take three years to get anything decent onto the electronic health record. We know we've tried. Well, what they didn't know is that the guy that ran the electronic health record had been himself in recovery for 20 years. He was very interested in this, and he helped us quite a bit. So here's a screenshot of one of the um, uh, panels that came up. This was, this was programmed and tested within two weeks. And uh, this is on EPIC, which is the major, uh, not certainly not the only, but it's the major, most widely used electronic health record uh, in healthcare. Uh, so we specified the diagnoses where this would be relevant, purposely restricted it to just breast cancer and related uh, cancers that uh, were affected by alcohol. Um, once that uh, was flagged, the electronic uh, health record said this person has the diagnosis that for whom, for which uh, screening brief intervention is relevant, so you have to do it. We then put in exactly the questions that they should ask and how they should ask them and the codes for the answers. Again, that's the, the that was the next uh, screen. And the final screen was told them exactly what to say and how to say it. Uh, we did not specify who would do that. We felt that's relevant, most relevant to the uh, uh, people who will specify clinical privileges. There, there, it involves clinical privileges to use the electronic health record. Not everybody's allowed to do everything on it. So we, but we brought the whole package back to them. Here's a package. It tells you when to do this. It tells you the questions to ask. You, all you have to do is specify who's going to do it and, and when. Okay? We had thought that this would be the kind of thing that would fit best with new patients who were just coming into uh, breast cancer treatment. And, and in fact, the, the cancer doctor said, no, that's a bad idea. They'll be way too... Um, worried and uh, concerned. Moreover, they're going to get heavy doses of radiotherapy and they may have had or get uh, surgery. They won't be drinking then. The, this is most germane in that post-recovery uh, period to give them the best chance possible of, of recovering. And in fact, we took their own words and turned it into the, to the profile that would introduce this. Because again, these doctors were terrified that all the women would leave in a huff, all the patients would leave in a huff. How dare you ask me about my lifestyle? Okay, so just to summarize briefly, it was first about get out of my face. I don't know you, I, you have nothing useful to me, go away. And I don't even care if I'm paid for it, it's, it's an annoyance to me. Once you get through that hurdle, then it was really very important stuff about who, how, where, when, how's it going to fit. All right, so we did teach them. In fact, the nurses were the ones that were most interested. The doctors, frankly, tolerated it. We insisted that the doctors understand this because we, we were quite sure the patients would come back and talk to them about it, and they did. They learned all the relevant uh, research. They knew what to say and how to say it, but it was the nurses that really took to this. And here are the early results. First of all, the dreaded fear, these women are going to run out in a huff and leave the place, never materialized. Just the opposite. These women, you could quite understandably, are looking for every advantage possible to try and uh, arrest their breast cancer. They felt that this was advanced care, this was the kind of thing that nobody else was doing, and, and that was true. Uh, so, so that went very well, and that too is important. Doctors are not going to do something that scares their patients away, and they shouldn't. We did have to uh, uh, change things around uh, several times. I don't frankly remember how many, but at least two or three times, where this was going to be going to fit, who was going to do it, how it was going to happen, 
la la la, that kind of thing. What we found is that um, I think we found in the first uh, 400 patients there was not a single case of alcoholism, but about six to seven percent of these women were drinking at unhealthy levels. Many because they were frankly anxious about their, their future. It's a lot to cope with. Then this happened. Their, their administrator wrote up this whole procedure for continuous quality improvement recognition and they got it. So now they're stars of the medical center and that didn't hurt one bit. Um, and with that, they said, well, uh, we're, gonna, we're a regional cancer training center, so we're going to train all the, the uh, cancer centers from Maryland through New York. Um, and, uh, and, and, that, and they're still doing that. I can't tell you whether these patients reduced their drinking and uh, had in, were in, their, in that way better able to cope with their, their cancer. We just didn't do that, that follow-up. But we did do a recent poll of the same place and to find out how things were going now three years later. No patient problems or complaints. Uh, it's a standard uh, continuous quality improvement measure. Uh, still very, very few people actually drink to the levels of, that would meet criteria for alcoholism, but they get 5 to 7 percent of women drinking in a way that's, that would otherwise interfere with their, their treatment. They're still doing SBI as part of the regional cancer uh, training. So um, perhaps I'll stop here and just uh, uh, take time to uh, answer any uh, kinds of questions you might have. As you're gathering your questions, I'll just reiterate. Uh, point one, don't even start down this road unless you can make the case that this procedure, screening and brief intervention, is relevant to the, to the uh, clinicians and most importantly to the patients that are going to get this care. Okay? Well, if, if, you, if it's, you can't make the case that it's going to give them an immediate return on their investment of time and effort, you're screwed. Once you get past that, it is entirely about not interrupting workflow, not getting in the way of good patient care, who's going to do it, who has to do it, who gets to do it, all that kind of thing. Um, and as is documented, it's not a clear, direct, straight, do not imagine that even with the imprimatur of the uh, CEO, Somebody's going to say, oh, sure, we'll, we'll knock that out. How do you want us to do it? Sure, we'll do that right away. That at least has not been our experience. So are there any, I can't see any uh, questions. And um, we don't have any questions at this time, but I just want to oh. remind everyone, you can feel free to submit them at any time during the presentation to either the questions box or the chat box. That's great. So uh, let's go on to a whole different story. So that was in a a high-tech medicine setting. This was the Advanced Cancer uh, uh, Treatment Center, okay? So we then went into schools. Um, this was a suburban New York City school system, and the papers were filled with uh, discussions about how the drug problems had gotten out of, uh, out of control. The um, School superintendent for this system, uh, himself in recovery, had uh, contacted Phoenix House, the um, very large uh, treatment provider in uh, New York City and New York State, and they, he said, look, no doubt about it, we need help. The teachers can't teach. Some of them are worried. It's, it's actually getting dangerous. Would you please help? So they said, we need your help, but we've got a few tiny little issues that you have to, will have to happen if we're to even be able to accept your help. First, we're broke. We don't have any money for new training, institutions, etc. The teachers union has said, without question, we won't do anything, anything that isn't already specified on our contracts. So don't look to us to do any more. And the school board was already furious. Why were they furious? He had, by approaching 
uh, Phoenix house, he had basically told the unspeakable story that there was substance use uh, problems in their schools and everybody was worried about the property values on their homes. So th these were not my opinions, these, these were recorded statements. They almost fired this guy for exposing something that had already been in the newspapers everywhere. So that was the sort of background that we came into. So if this thing was going to work, what would happen? You would have some kind of magic procedure that could be done by people other than teachers with the students of teachers in a way that didn't affect uh, education, didn't get in the way of uh, normal learning, that would reduce substance use, uh, that, that the, the students would accept and actually do, and that would ultimately reduce substance use problems. So that's, that's a pretty tall order. And, and we thought screening brief interventions might do it. And so let's take this problem apart. How, how are we going to do this? Um, we actually agreed with the teachers union. We didn't think teachers uh, should do it. They hadn't been trained. It wasn't in their mission. God knows they had a lot of other things they had to deal with. And we thought, do you really want the, the, the teacher that's going to write the recommendation for your kid to go to college to also be your, your substance use counselor? I, I don't think so. So it was directly in the interest and the mission of the health department of the state of New York to do this. Indeed, they had wanted to do screening and brief interventions, but their charter said they can't do it in schools. That's out of bounds. The only place you could do it, that is that they could pay for it, they could license and authorize this to be done, was in a registered health clinic. And Phoenix House had the bright idea, why not turn one of these uh, schools, a, a, an un, a place, an unused part of a school, into a registered health clinic. So that clinic would be operated by people who were not teachers, but it would be situated in the school system. And I, I thought it was a terrific idea. It was not uh, a snap to do, but it was the germ of what ultimately became the, the solution here. Um, we thought, too, you want somebody for whom uh, it's, it's in their interest to do this. Uh, they had a school nurse, but the school nurse did not want any part of this and didn't feel qualified and had other things to do. And so that was basically a no. So what we ended up doing with money from the, uh, uh, the, the, the health department and Phoenix House, so we built and licensed a, a health clinic uh, in the, a junior and senior high school to try this out. And uh, it took about three months to do it, and the school board was fine with it because they didn't have to spend any money. They weren't going to lose any money. Um, none of the teachers were going to have to do anything um, um, and all that. Now, the next question was, okay, great. Now you've got a place to do all this. Why in the world would a kid tell you, geez, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked. I'm drinking way too much for my health. I'm using marijuana in a manner that's compromising my safety. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm glad you asked. So we thought this is going to really have to be done carefully or it's going to be a tremendous waste of time. These kids will simply not answer. They'll, they'll snicker at it. They'll laugh at it. So we started down the road with the first round of solutions. And as I say, we created a health clinic. And uh, thanks go to the, uh, uh, the health department of New York. Uh, and who, who arranged things so they could get a, a right-sized clinic. Uh, this was, uh, this was a, a junior and senior high school system of about uh, 1,000 students. Um, and so they got licensing, and Phoenix House became the counselors who were specially trained to do uh, adolescent counseling were also licensed to bill for uh, screening and brief interventions. It was $19 for a screen, 
and $24 for a brief intervention. And with all kinds of uh, heavy math, we, we all figured out that, that you could sustain uh, that level of activity of a, a couple of counselors in a, in a, in a, with that kind of reimbursement. And that was important too. Okay. Next, it was a very important point in this whole thing is to specify that in this context, what we were doing, screening and brief intervention, was prevention, it wasn't treatment. Two reasons why. Um, big one is you did not need in New York State and most states, I, I not all, but most states, you do not need permission to do a preventive intervention. Uh, as long as the risks are lower than the, the, the risks of associated with contracting whatever it is you're trying to prevent, whether it's flu or car accidents or, or uh, teenage pregnancy or, or in this case substance use, uh, you, you, you don't want to have uh, kids have to go and ask and self-identify, may I please get uh, uh, preventive uh, work for um, you know, uh, uh, sex, active sexual life, uh, because it, it, you know it's just another barrier. So you don't have to do that with a prevention intervention. So parents, parents, uh, permission was not necessary. The second was equally important. Uh, we've tried to think ahead. Now the kid's going to fill out. Uh, maybe he wants to become a policeman or a fireman, or he wants to get a license to fly an airplane or whatever. On those kinds of applications, it'll ask you, have you ever received substance abuse treatment? And if you get screening and brief intervention, you're not getting substance abuse treatment. Extremely important. You're getting a brief intervention that is designed to prevent uh, uh, development of a substance use problem. Okay. So Phoenix House was very capable and uh, Office of Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services in New York also very capable and, and also the Department of Education. We got all of them involved and turned this into a, um, a site that would uh, try this all out. So you can already see how complicated this was financially in terms of liability, in terms of scheduling, everything. But we're still uh, at a point where the main question was, and, and this was my main question, these kids are never going to self-disclose. In the um, typical uh, once-a-year surveys, which are anonymous, you don't sign them, uh, they get in the, 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 this school had gotten something like 22 to 26 percent self-disclosure of any kind of substance use at all. So we thought, in a in a in some kind of a face-to-face -face issue, they're not going to they're going they're they're going to deny or they won't even do it. So we went to Brenda Curtis from the University of Pennsylvania, who had had a long uh, experience in creating uh, engaging video games. Uh, she worked with the same kind of high-resolution. Uh, engaging graphics that you see on, on some of these uh, uh, computer games. But she, she turned this into a way of educating kids in a, a, a language that was either English or Spanish that was written purposely at or below the eighth grade level. There were a lot of uh, educational problems in this school system as well. But more than anything else, it was engaging. These kids liked it, and we pre-tested it. They found it really interesting. We had an alcohol uh, breathalyzer calculator with the data from supplied by the National Institute on Alcoholism. We and we asked them a few questions about their their uh, height, weight, male, female, and then showed them and allowed them to see how many glasses of wine, how many uh, cans of beer would produce what level of alcohol impairment and what that was roughly uh, like. It also educated them on something that they were very, that everybody was very worried about, alcohol overdose. Yes, not drug overdose, alcohol overdose. Uh, been, had been uh, several kids 
who had drunk way too much, had sat in a been sat in a corner, and with their head down, looking for all the world like they were asleep. In fact, they were passed out with restricted breathing, and ultimately died. So we we inserted a little video in this thing that showed how you can be a hero, how you can save a life uh, by putting your friend on his side and making sure their breathing is uh, not restricted. Okay. Uh, we also incorporated the uh, screening instrument used by uh, the state of New York. It had been approved by the, uh, the craft. And I, and I simply have to say that when I talk to researchers, that's what they think this is all about. Which instrument? Oh, the craft, the long craft or the short craft? Uh, we would use a manual for this. It is not about the instrument. That was the least important thing to the teachers, to the patient, to the kids, to, to everything. Uh, that was, it, it's not that it's unimportant, but it was in the scope of things, it was not the big deal. We also took the uh, uh, opportunity in creating the software to do what uh, Amazon and uh, uh, Pandora and uh, Spotify and lots of other uh, uh, more sophisticated software programs do. They ask you a few brief questions about who you are and who, what your interests are. Are you a male or are you female? Are you, uh, what age grade, age range are you? And what are some of your interests? Why? Because a pitch about alcohol and drug abuse is going to be different, even if the facts are the same, it's going to be different for a 16-year-old uh, Hispanic uh, girl who wants to go to college than it will be for a 12-year-old African-American boy who's interested in playing football. They're interested in different things, and uh, people who sell you products know that, so they don't pitch their product the same way to different groups. So we, we did that. Uh, final point is, and again, thanks to the uh, Department of uh, Health, we realized that we could deliver the whole thing in counseling anonymously. That is, a kid could come in, he could sign in as 007 on the computer, uh, he would appear as 007 even when he went on for his counseling session, which is what happened right after the computer screening. I didn't get to that yet. The counselor did not need to know that it was John Jones. He could call him 007. Uh, again, an effort to make things completely, uh, set the occasion where self-disclosure is not going to hurt you. Okay? So, so the procedure was as follows. They, these kids would come in uh, four at a time. They'd be relieved from school, a non-academic class, like a study hall or driver's ed. Or, uh, um, they would come four at a time. They would do a 20-minute to 25 or 30-minute, really, uh, screening on the computer. The results of the computer would be printed out immediately to two counselors who were in adjoining offices. That the, so the kid finishes the screening, walks over to the counselor's office and says, hi, and the counselor's got all the information right in front of them. Remember, the, the counselor doesn't know if this is uh, John Jones or Sam Smith, okay? But they have everything relevant. They know how much alcohol is being used or, or other drugs. They know uh, uh, what the kids' interests are. And they used motivational interviewing techniques to sell information about safe and non-safe use of alcohol, marijuana, and other substances. And this was all very much tailored. I'll show you that in a minute. And we needed a detailed protocol. You couldn't say even to very well-trained counselors. So look, talk to them, uh, discuss things with them. No, you had to deliver a message very quickly. The whole thing had to take less than an hour because by that time they had to go to another class. Okay, so this had to be done very quickly. 
and it had to be done in a single session with the opportunity to come back if the kid wanted to for, for more sessions. If the kid didn't get enough or wanted more, he could get more sessions. But the whole thing had to be done in one 20-minute screening followed by roughly a 20-minute uh, uh, brief intervention. And, and Brenda Curtis from uh, the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania is credited with this. And yes, that uh, software is available and um, it's being in use. Okay, so the big deal was to create a protocol that the counselor could use in rapid decision making and how to pitch the, the brief intervention. And remember, this is anonymous. It didn't say, you know, what's your name, where do you live, la, la, la. He had some of that information printed out, but not the name. Okay? So we used a red, yellow, green protocol. So most kids had few to no problems, reported few to no problems. Okay? We called that green. And we took that opportunity. Uh, even if a kid said, no, I don't drink, and I don't like drinking, and I, I hate it, we took that opportunity to say, that, that's a pretty healthy decision. And uh, here's some of the things you can tell your friends if they pressure you. Boom, just like that. Um, we also had to spend a lot of time with the RED protocol. These were kids who self-disclosed really serious uh, uh, levels of alcohol and other substance use. We had several kids who uh, self-disclosed uh, injecting heroin, uh, getting drunk before she, they came to school and driving to school intoxicated, things like that. We said, those kids don't get motivational interviewing. That session, it, the motivational interviewing is going to be designed to make it clear that they should talk to their parents. And the goal of the session was to get the counselor and the kid to call up the parents and bring them into the situation. Why? I thought you said this was anonymous. For everybody else it was, but when you exceed a safety threshold, everybody agreed, your first duty is to protect the kid. When you have enough information that you know things are, are, are dire, call in the parents. No parent wants to find out that their kid is getting some kind of treatment or something uh, that they don't know anything about. Okay, so, so the green, not much of a problem at all. Red is a problem, but we hoped it would be uh, very small. We thought the great majority of kids we're going to talk to were going to say, yeah, I've, I've used alcohol, I've used it on the weekend, but I don't see it's a problem. That's where motivational interviewing and techniques of uh, reflect and um, rolling with resistance and all of that stuff come into come into play. Okay, but again, it was a protocol and it was literally printed in green if there was very few problems, in yellow if they were in the questionable range, and in bright red uh, the other. Okay, um, with in association with all this clinical work we had to get authorization to bill for um, the, the procedure. Otherwise, this thing would fall on its face. It wouldn't be financially viable. Okay, so how'd it go? Well, right off the bat, insurance didn't want to pay beans. Um, and uh, the, the Department of Health used this information to um, go after the insurance companies to say, look, uh, this is an approved protocol. We've all done, these are done by licensed people. La la, in a, in a licensed facility, you've got to do it. Um, we ultimately needed parental consent for billing. That was a problem. Uh, we didn't need to tell the kid, the parent, anything about what the kid was getting. But you you can't just make up bills and have uh, an insurer pay them. So that was uh, actually a problem. The teachers didn't like it to start with because, um, especially in the early going, the kids were out of uh, class, they didn't know it, so we had to have much better scheduling, much better uh, uh, use of time that would otherwise go to study halls or, or, or non-academic things. Um, 
uh, we had some computer problems, but they were easy to solve, and we had big training problems. All the counselors that were asked to do this were certified and uh, licensed by the state of New York and, and, and under the employee of Phoenix House. We went through seven counselors who all wanted to do it. Only uh, three were actually able to do motivational interviewing. Um, most said, oh yeah, I do it all the time. God help us if they really were. They, they had really no ability whatever to do it. Two were absolutely excellent. Um, and uh, two others were, 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 were good. All right, so very interesting. Now it's, now it's in full uh, bore, and we did it uh, for a nine-month period. First semester, uh, we had no complaints about, by the parents, none at all. We had no complaints by the teachers and no administrative complaints at all. In fact, it was eerie. No teacher in either the senior or junior high school ever asked what the hell was going on with their students down in this in this new behavioral health counseling center. Okay, uh, which I found very strange. Ditto parents involved. Nah, I don't. I'm not. Whatever. Who cares? So in the first 16 weeks, we screened 480 kids. And 53% said met criteria for a yellow protocol. That is, reported a level of substance use um, that was at least potentially problematic. Um, <laughs> that was amazing. That was more than twice the number that had self-reported any substance use at all in completely confidential paper and pencil screenings that they do all the time. Um, Another very important point is 42% of the students that met the yellow protocol came back voluntarily for another um, motivational interviewing session. Uh, in the first 16 weeks, four students and nine parents ultimately were referred to treatment uh, via this. Um, we also found that it was very importantly it was financially viable. Phoenix House could make a living for two counselors doing about 500 kids a semester, uh, two to four a day, uh, uh, yeah, and in non-academic uh, settings, they could make a living with that, so it was financially uh, viable. Um, it got so useful, um, there, I have no uh, structured evaluation data to report, but I can tell you that uh, the administration said, we like this. We also have problems with bullying. Uh, we have depression, suicide, and, and uh, diabetes screens. We'd also like to, to could you do that too? We, we couldn't, but it gives you a flavor for, for how, how it was going. Um, the final thing I can tell you is, on the basis of this, it was published. Uh, on, Brenda Curtis was the first author, and uh, the state of New York is now implementing this in New York City in a, a large structured trial. Again, same number of, of practical problems, but that's, that's how it's uh, going. So again, I'll, I'll probably stop here for a minute and see uh, if there are any questions about the second uh, story. Thanks, Tom. I do have a couple questions, but I also have a hand raised, so I want to see if Selma Moore would like to speak directly onto the webinar. Selma, I'm going to unmute you if you want to unmute your personal mic. No. Okay. All right. And again, if you would like to speak onto the webinar, you can use the raise your hand feature. Uh, so, Tom, one of our questions that's come in is, do you think SBIRT can work in mental health settings? If so, do you know the research for SBIRT in those settings? Uh, well, you know, they, they once asked Mark Twain, do you believe in baptism? And Mark Twain said, believe in it. Hell, I've seen it done. So, yeah, I think it can be done in mental health. It's done every day in most of your better mental health settings. Indeed, 
I would have to say that with a, a you know a population prevalence of no less than 50% in any mental health setting that I've ever worked in, uh, you are remiss if you don't do it. So, um, and again, it's you, you have to uh, the 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 purpose of this little presentation is not to give you a lot of research showing. Uh, uh, you know which instrument to use and all that. It's to f help you figure out why it's important, how you can make it fit in, and that's particularly important in mental health settings. Um, even in seriously mentally ill patients, per perhaps especially in seriously mentally ill patients where the prevalence rates are even higher, um, it's quite important. Uh, but even for lower severity, but much more prevalent uh, cases of anxiety, PTSD, uh, eating disorders, uh, depression, all that, um, you're nuts if you don't do screening and brief intervention. Uh, because you can, because it will inform uh, your medication strategy, because it will inform your counseling strategy, and because you can get paid for it, okay? So I, I'm probably going to have to move on. I only have another uh, roughly 15, 20 minutes. So if there's another question I can quickly answer, happy to do that. Actually, we can save the rest of the questions till the end here, Tom. And if we don't get to any, I'll send them out in a Word document that we can disseminate the answers to all the attendees. Sure. So uh, the last little story here, and again, that, the, the last question is very uh, good because um, it's not a question of whether you can do it in a mental health, in an emergency room, in a, in a uh, you know, trauma center. It's been done. It's been done many times. The question is, how is it going to fit in your mental health, trauma center, ER, whatever, okay? And here's a, a good example. This is, this is work that's going on right now under a uh, PCORI grant to uh, Adam Brooks. Uh, screening and brief intervention plus case management in an inner city hospital. What's interesting about this is that we had approached this large inner city hospital um, years ago and said, look, we showed them the prevalence data of uh, substance use problems that permeated their their population. Uh, you can bill for this, Mr. Hospital. You, uh, you're not going to make a fortune, but you're not going to lose money. It'll inform your practice. It'll perhaps reduce some of your overdose uh, issues and all that. Are you interested? No. Go away. We're busy. You, you, you know, go peddle your papers. Okay. But then something happened. And this is happening all over the country now. Uh, this inner city hospital gets a very significant proportion of its revenue from CMS, Medicaid and Medicare. And in 2012, M Medicaid and Medicare said to hospitals, look, we're not going to continue paying for what we call rapid rehospitalization. That is, a readmission to a hospital for any reason within 30 days of a discharge from that hospital. And we mean it, because if you can't stop it, if you can't get your rapid readmission rate below 26% within, you, you understand this now, so 100 patients are discharged in January. Uh, many of these inner city hospitals, they have 30 and 40 patients back in the hospital before the end of February, okay? And they said, if you can't get a, 26% or lower, we're going to fine you 5% of your total revenues. Now, that's a great deal of money. All of a sudden, we became very interesting to this hospital. But again, not at all the way we, we thought would happen. Now, the hospital administrator said, we want you guys, we don't want you to do this as part of admission screening. Oh, no. We want it to be part of discharge planning because that's where we're feeling the financial pain. Now, uh, again, in, this is a hospital system. Um, this is a hospital system where, like most places, 
doctors have never been trained, nurses have never been trained, pharmacists have never been trained in substitutes. That's always been somebody else's job. It's been something that went on in these, these funny little treatment centers someplace else in the city. There was never anything in a hospital about it. So consequently, everyone knew something had to be done. Nobody wanted to do it. So, um, and the hospital did not want to pay for this. They knew they were going to lose uh, roughly three million dollars in 2013 if nothing changed. So, so I, I told them, I said, you know, that's your budget right there. You, you basically have a three million dollar budget. If you spend two million nine hundred ninety nine dollars, you will have made a profit uh, by not losing all of your three million. Okay, and again, uh, this is very different than the the what I started out with. They wanted to find people at the high end of the substance use curve because these are the ones that were most likely. And, and again, it was their data, not ours, that showed if you want to predict rapid readmission to your hospital for any reason, regardless of what your, di your original diagnosis is or whatever brought you back into the hospital, like you know, a wound infection or a broken leg, whatever. If you want to predict who's going to come back into your hospital within 30 days, it's depression, alcohol, and drug use. They're the big three. Okay, so so Adam Brooks is really uh, the guy that's been doing this work. And if there's uh, real important questions about how this is going, I urge you to contact him at TRI. Uh, so again, uh, we thought about screening and brief intervention, but it's the, these are people whose whose substance use problems were were should have been obvious, but but weren't. But and more importantly, in a screening and brief intervention, the emphasis is to find uh, early indications of a substance use and then use motivational interviewing techniques to have the person be their own best source of motivation for change. In this situation, we're talking about much more severe people. Um, and they did not have, on one hand, they had a lot of people involved in the discharge um, planning process. They had visiting nurses. They had the discharge planning group. They had continuing care being offered by whatever department or, or, or uh, a branch of medicine that they were getting care for. So a lot of people were involved, but nobody was really organizing this. And they correctly suggested that if we want these guys to engage into outpatient continuing care and not come back in for at least 31 days, well, we're going to need case management. Nobody was doing case management. So they went to Philadelphia Health Management Corporation who had a case management contract in that hospital. And we put them plus PHMC uh, together. So uh, people uh, from TRI trained discharge planning staff in the hospital to do the screening and the identification of people with likely depression, alcohol, and other drug problems. But then it had to be handed off for continuing management and a continuing protocol that would really engage these people into uh, uh, substance use services as part of their discharge planning. So um, I'm trying to go pretty quickly. Um, uh, again, everybody said, well, we can't afford, we don't have it, la, la, la. And, and basically I said, oh, yes, you can afford it because if you don't do this, you're going to lose $3 million. CMS told you this. They're going to they're gonna, uh, penalize you. So you better figure a way. So um, one of the people we went to was Terry Horton, who was in charge of primary care at Christiana Medical Center, who had used recovering people themselves as counselors in um, Christiana Hospital because he had a different protocol where he had nurses identify patients with serious problems, and he dispatched these recovering guys uh, as unofficial uh, coaches to, to help them uh, deal with that. And th this is very, very popular in Christiana and uh, was used that way. We didn't have that in Philadelphia, but Terry coached 
uh, Public Health Management, Philadelphia Health Management Corporation, in giving them their case managers special protocols. Uh, Adam Brooks developed and has published special protocols for how to engage discharged patients into continuing care in a manner that, that won't hurt them. And I got to hand it to PHMC. They were not stupid. They said, look, you want us to go at risk uh, for money that will be saved by you. So look, let's make a deal. If there's not a hospital readmission by, from, by a patient that's uh, under our care, we would like 20% of the the uh, hospital the average hospital admission that would have occurred. Okay, if we don't uh, stop the, the the hospital readmission, you don't pay us. You only pay us if it works. And begrudgingly, they agreed to do this, and that provided the the money that was necessary. The screening was uh, billed separately, and uh, that paid entirely for all the screening and the case management was paid uh, in a shared risk policy between PHMC and the uh, and the hospital. So results are still under uh, way. Uh, Adam will be having a full report but they've expanded it. They uh, At an operational level they feel it's working. It's not costing them uh, much uh, money. They are showing reductions in readmissions to the hospital and in ER visits. But, and this is a general summary, um, I think you can see from the three stories that, that I've presented, and they are stories. These are All of them are, are either have been published or will be published, but they're, they're mostly stories about fit and how it, it can work. Um, so there's not going to be, I'm certain of this, a generic SBI. There's a generic blood pressure. You get blood pressure taken the same way just about any, doesn't matter what disease, where you are, who you are. That's not going to be true for SBI. This is going to have to fit. And that's, that's the big point. Fit is it. If this isn't done in a manner that meets the selfish needs, the clinical needs, the financial needs, of the people doing it and the patients on whom it's being done. It ain't going to happen. Well, the three stories here show that with some ingenuity, with some engineering, you can make things fit. Um, this, in my mind, is going to be, everybody wants this to happen in primary care. And it's obviously a logical place for it. But think about it. Where it worked best for hands was in a breast cancer clinic, well, to, to or, or, or in another setting where you were going to prevent a readmission. That was the goal. In a, in a primary care setting, the average patient walks in with three to four problems. Maybe it's diabetes, hypertension, uh, maybe they have an allergy, who knows what, maybe they have a cold, whatever. There's a lot going on. The role of alcohol and other drugs is different for each of those problems problems. You want a primary care doc who's got 12 minutes to screen and uh, do brief interventions that uh, will target how the role of alcohol and other drugs in each of those conditions? I don't think so. Nursing, maybe. Um, uh, nursing seems to like this. They like it a hell of a lot better than the, the, the physicians. Uh, nursing has always seen this as part of their, their role. And so it may fit as part of a nursing protocol, but I don't see it in uh, primary care. Final thing, it's, it, it really summed up by the fit is it. Uh, whenever you want to institute screening and brief intervention, you've got a lot of customers. Um, the, uh, for example, the CEO, uh, uh, like in the breast cancer situation, he didn't even know what it was. All he knew was he had to have it to pass JCAH. Okay. That's an issue. You got to figure a way to meet that. The chief medical officer wanted CQI credits. He wants better care. He sure as hell doesn't want anything to interfere with care. Uh, the CFO, the financial officer, says, uh, you know, if clinical care is important, we can't lose money. So it doesn't have to make a ton, but it but it can't lose money. 
physicians and, and all healthcare workers really, they're, they're up for anything that will improve the kind of care that they're already providing, emphasis, kind of care they're already providing. They don't want you to come in and say, oh, stop doing care the way you've always done it and uh, do it the way I tell you to. That Nobody's going to do that. But if this will fit into what they're doing, if it can, the argument can be made that it could do better for the patient and make them look better, now you got a chance. But even then, it's got to fit into the workflow, the work culture. And uh, rest of the clinical staff. The big problem is this one. Nobody wants this. Nobody. There isn't an occupational code for a screening and brief intervention. It's going to be done by people who are doing other things who have never been or very, very rarely have been trained in, in anything having to do with substance use. So most don't have any clinical interest. For most clinicians, the training they've had is, is worse than no training at all. Most have rotated through an emergency room at some time in their clinical training. They've seen alcohol and drug addiction at its worst. Lying, screaming, dangerous uh, people at the worst point in their medical career. And it, it, it leaves um, uh, a sort of a brand in their brain. Oh, now I know about addiction, I know about substance use, and I know that I don't like it. Well, in fact, they don't know. They haven't seen a patient recover. They don't know a recovered, recovering patient when he walks in their, their uh, office, and, and they're, they're unprepared for it. They can't imagine kindly Mrs. Jones, who's having trouble uh, regulating her, her diabetes, is actually drinking, you know, a, 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 a bottle of wine a day or sherry or something. Uh, they, they never even think about it. Um, they also have no clinical optimism because of the kind of prejudicial views that they have and the poor training they've had. They can't imagine that somebody is going to reduce the substance use problems that they, that they have. Um, and it's way beyond just stigma. It's real discrimination. They will tell you, it, it, not very subtly at all, I don't want anything to do with those patients. And again, you can tell them 20 times, I'm talking about a guy who's, got, who's walking in here with track marks all up and down his arms. I'm talking about a person whose substance use, though, is not at the addiction, addiction level, but is using too much for their general health. They, they don't hear that. They hear addict, and they don't like them, and they don't want to deal with them. But listen, not that long ago when somebody said AIDS or HIV, a big red flag went off too. Uh, that's gotten, um, um, we, we've gotten past that to, to a large extent. And now it's the law. You have to do this, and you have to give patients with substance use problems, not just addiction, all substance use problems. You have to give them the same kind of care that everybody else gets. Insurers have to provide the same kind of benefits as everybody else gets. That's not Tom McClellan's idea. It's not a, a, a general suggestion. It's the law, and it's the subject of discrimination suits now. So the word stigma you can put in your back pocket. It's discrimination now. And the final thing is, um, again, People, somebody's going to make money at this, and here's why. There is a science to this. It's a very good thing to do, screening brief intervention toward reducing substance use problems in, in, in these populations. Uh, it will save healthcare dollars. Not my opinion, it's a fact. It saves healthcare dollars. And somebody like Philadelphia Health Management says, I want a piece of those savings. I'll make this my business, just like uh, Waste Management Corporation has gone around to uh, uh, you know towns and cities all over this country and said, "Look, you are doing waste management stupidly, and it's costing you money. Give me the contract, but I want the savings as well." They bring science to it, etc. Um, it's an it's an ugly thing to say, but I'm just trying, in the spirit of this whole presentation, to tell you in a, in a, from a real world perspective what it's going to take. Uh, not to demonstrate that it can work,
but to actually implement it in a financially viable, clinically viable, attractive way. So I hope these three uh, demonstrations have um, given you some ideas for what you could do in your own place. I have a little bit, I actually don't have much more time, but I'm happy to answer questions um, and send the answers back through you. And um, perhaps with this, I'll, I'll just quit. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. McLellan. Um, I want to thank everyone for your great questions. I do see a couple more are coming into the questions box. Uh, we will see those into a document that's sent to Dr. McLellan and then disseminate the answers following the webinar. Uh, at this time, I'd like to go over our evaluation and CEU instructions. You are going to receive a few emails from us following this webinar, and in these emails will be a link to the recording of the webinar as well as a PDF version of today's slides. Also included in the email will be a link to our evaluation and continuing education credits and certificate information. Our grant evaluators are required and pleased to collect feedback from all event participants. Completion of this evaluation is critical to maintaining our funding and continuing to provide quality education and materials. Your participation is appreciated and the evaluation should take no more than two minutes of your time. You're also going to be receiving additional instructions regarding requesting your free PCB or NADAC CEUs, as well as how to download your certificate of attendance. If you have any further questions, you can feel free to contact us at info at IRETA.org. I also want to remind everyone that we do have two upcoming webinars within this series. On December 2nd, 2015, John McAteer will be presenting What's Your Take on EHRs and SBIRT? And on January 6th, Jim Winkle will be presenting as well. You can register for these at myireta.org. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for your participation. And again, if you have any additional questions, feel free to contact us at info at ireta.org. Are we off?